Department in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. And we are very privileged to have Minister Audrey Tang joining us um, for the Spotlight Taiwan uh, lecture hosted by the University of Edinburgh in collaboration with the Kilo Kelowna Taiwanese Cultural Society in Canada. And before we introduce our speakers, um, we would like to thank the Taipei representative office in the UK, Edinburgh office, and the Ministry of Culture in Taiwan for the sponsorship and to Dr. Li Hengxi at, at University for project management. Um, due to that limit of time, um, our warm thanks to many friends and counselors and um, general support are acknowledged in the chat box. Um, yeah, and, and our keynote speaker, Audrey Tang, is Taiwan's Digital Minister for Social Innovation. She is a software programmer known for revitalizing the computer languages and for building the online spreadsheet system in cooperation with Dan Bricklin. And she served on Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committee and K-12 Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. Previously, the minister worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics um, with Oxford University Press um, with social text on social interaction design. She actively contributes to G0V, um, a vibrant community that focuses on uh, creating tools for the civil society with the call to folk. Uh, the government and uh, uh, currently she also you know is contributes to various um, apps uh, in the pandemic as well and maybe we'll hear more from the minister later on about the you know um, her view on the apps and our discussant Dr. Wen Lai uh, today and uh, completed her his medical training at Seton University in New Jersey and Case Western Reserve University and University Hospital of Cleveland in, in the States before she, he returned to Canada and opened his own practice in Kelowna. And he is also the clinical assistant professor at the University of British Columbia and a neurologist and sleep specialist um, practicing at uh, Kelowna General Hospital and the president for Kelowna Taiwanese Cultural Society. So followed by the minister's speech and the conversation with Dr. Lai, and we'll open the floor for um, a 30 minutes of Q&A um, for housekeeping. So the audience microphones um, are muted currently, and then you'll be able to, we'll open the microphone later on uh, for the Q&A session. And we are very much looking forward to uh, learning about, firstly, the minister's vision of transformative technology and social innovation. So um, please join us and to welcome Minister and Audrey Tan. And over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Good local time. Uh, can you see and hear me? OK, it's working well. Uh, I'll try sharing my screen uh, and we'll see if that works. Uh, do you see a cute dog? Okay, you do see a cute dog. Okay, um, so uh, this is Zong Chai, a Shiba Inu uh, Chai Chen, right? Zong Chai. Um, and so um, the Zong Chai Shiba dog is a symbol uh, of our not just social innovation, but also the overall strategy of countering the pandemic with no lockdown so far, uh, and also countering the infodemic, the disinformation crisis with no takedown so far. Um, and we intend to keep it this way. And this very cute dog uh, is a real dog, lives with the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. In each ministry, we have a team of people called participation officers or POs that engage the public on trending hashtags, just like media officer uh, addresses journalist questions or parliamentary officer address MPs questions. The participation officer is in charge, for example, to explain the physical distancing rules, saying when you're indoor, please keep three Shibas away, wear a mask, uh, or when you're outdoors, keep two Shibas away, explaining in multiple languages the importance of covering your mouth and nose when sneezing, and also <clears throat> spread the idea that masks are there to protect your mouth from your own unwashed hands. 
And these innovative ways of communication is not just one direction. It's truly multi-directional, what I call listening at scale. Indeed, in the very beginning uh, of this pandemic in 2019, when Dr. Li Wenliang's message, and I quote, that there's seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market gets posted on the social media worldwide, in my knowledge, only in Taiwan, did it result in a decisive government action after a young doctor, No More Pipe, she posted uh, this message on PTT, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, except the PTT has no advertisers or shareholders. PTT is, is in the social sector, a open community, literally a student pet project for 25 years, uh, that people are in there for social purpose, not for the uh, profit. And because of that, the PTT contributor triaged this message immediately. So on the very next day, we began health inspections for flight passengers coming in from Wuhan. And so this is again a fertile ground for collective intelligence and social innovation. We also has this toll-free number and now a toll-free SMS number too, uh, 1922 a one-stop shop where you can call, regardless of whether you have a smartphone, you can call using a landline and so on to ask about pretty much anything related to the pandemic and the infodemic. And there's more than 2 million calls last year alone to this number. And often it results in decisive government action, also literally in the next 24 hours. For example, last April, there was a young boy that called saying, hey, I have the mask you rationed, but all I got was pink masks. But all the boys in my class have navy blue medical grade mask. I don't want to wear pink to school. Do something about it. The very next day on the 2 p.m. daily press conference, at a suggestion of the participation officer, the person who lives with the Shiba dog, everyone wore pink. And also at uh, his suggestion, um, Minister Chen Shizhong even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So suddenly the boy became the most hit boy in the class for only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. Uh, and so this civic uh, participation results also in the fair distribution of PPEs, such as the mask map, which was contributed by the Gov0G0V community uh, in Tainan initially, that uh, shows the available PPEs around each spot. Uh, and I brought this idea, talked to the premier and said, we need to trust citizens with real time open data so that this data is updated every 30 seconds. And now uh, one year after the mask rationing map rolled out, the same team also wrote out the 1922 SMS service that allows a very easy check-in in public venues. It has very good adoption that the five telecoms have agreed to waive SMS fees in a per message basis. So it's all toll free also, and people can just use their phone to scan the QR code or even manually enter the random code of the place and provide checking for quick contact tracing. And we also have a counter disinformation line bot that doubles as a QR code scanner so people can receive cute dog messages on a daily basis while providing safety check-ins that allowed um, including the feature phones and smartphones to both work. And so I would simply say that the attention to privacy protection, the attention to the cybersecurity is built upon the existing services that people already come to trust because the data is only stored in the telecoms. I mean, if you don't trust your telecoms with your SMS, probably you should switch a different telecom, but we still uh, do provide the option of pen and paper, or sometimes people use a lian shu zhang a, a, a seal, an ink-based way to leave their names. And that's still uh, uh, on a parallel track with the check-in service. But again, this is a people-public-private partnership in that the government didn't come up with this idea by ourselves. 
but rather the people, the Gov Zero people, came up with this idea that are widely applicable and sets the social norms so that we implement and work with the economic sector, such as the telecoms, to implement. And uh, I'm told that I should keep my opening remark to 10 minutes, uh, and so this is my 10 minutes. Looking forward to the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, uh, Minister. And um, yeah, I think um, followed by your um, 10 minutes, uh, the, the, the very brief, um, quite inspiring talk, and I think we'll invite the, um, the some conversation questions from our discussant and Dr. Wen Lai. Um, first. Hey, thank you, Dr. Yan, and good morning um, to Mr. Uh, Minister Tang, and good night to um, Dr. Yang in UK, and thank you so much for letting us co-host this um, very inspirational um, a session and discussion with Mr. Tang. Uh, I would like to first um, uh, express my very sincere, sincere gratitude. Uh, your story has been an inspiration for many, and we are so honored to have you here with us today. My, my very first question is about the journey that you have gone through that make you who you are now. Um, social order are often maintained by enforcing certain restriction and conformity. Individuals who are not fitting into the box are often considered as deviant or often are facing external discrimination and perhaps more frequently the internal conflict. While facing many challenges being different, would you mind sharing who or what influence or inspire you the most and what best help you transcend from being different to now being successful? And what wisdom can you share with those who are currently struggling in finding their sense of own identity in a society that has very many different perspectives from theirs? Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, my main influence uh, came from my middle school head of school, uh, Principal Du Huiping. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I still remember uh, going to visit uh, her office explaining to her with some email printout that I want to do research 16 hours a day on the internet, on the World Wide Web, which is a really new thing, by the way, in 1996. Uh, and uh, Principal Du Huiping asked about what I mean by 16 hours of research. And I simply explained that there's this archive, A-R-X-I-V, preprint server, uh, it's still around by Cornell University, that I found that people creating knowledge uh, did not treat me as young or different uh, because across the email, all you can see are each other's contributions anyway. So I just wrote to the authors of those preprint papers and we started doing research together in no time. They didn't know I was just 14 years old. They didn't know that I have to uh, look up a lot of dictionary words in order to complete an email because my English was rather rusty uh, back then. So um, Principal Du Huiping heard my argument. I prepared a lot of counter argument to her opposition uh, in my mind, uh, but she thought about it for a minute and said simply, that okay, from tomorrow on, you don't have to go to my school anymore. And I'm like, okay, what about the compulsory education? And she's like, okay, I'll cover that for you. Meaning probably that she'll fake the records. <clears throat> and so what I'm, and what I'm saying is that, um, that instill in my mind, this feeling that a career public service is the most innovative of all people because she has the, the guts really and the empathy to uh, cover for me and not just for me but later on we will um, develop together the alternative education act that enable up to 10 percent of taiwanese school children to also choose homeschool or a alternative school not bound by existing curriculum. And so this then paved the way of the new basic education curriculum, which already prescribes autonomous learning, as well as interaction across generations, as well as cross-disciplinary transcultural studies. Uh, and so I do think that on the internet, nobody is strange. Even if your interest is so niche that only one person in 1,000 is interested in that. Still, in Taiwan, that means something like 20K people. Uh, and so if you join the internet group, uh, then you will feel that there's nothing uh, abnormal 
about caring about um, Swift trust, about coding, about things like that um, as a 14 years old. So that's my main um, answer to your question is that the career public service need to co-innovate across generations. Great. Well, th thank you so very much. Um, so there's, there's a bit of extension on, on that particular question, and, and this is stemming from your discussion uh, with Taiwan Insider on July 20th, 2020. Uh, you have talked about um, how digital uh, social innovation is to bring technology where people are rather than asking people to conform to the government. In your opinion, what can be done as a society, as a government to be more inclusive um, including those people who are considered different, uh, those people who are not fitting into the box uh, according to the standard that we know of uh, through digital social innovations. I think inclusion begins with co-creation, again, across generations. Um, you see here, Grandma Yang, um, when I develop new digital services such as the mask rationing pre-ordering system and now the vaccine appointment system, I work closely with my own grandmother who is now 88 years old. Uh, and she often introduced her younger friend to me to run such focus group studies. Uh, and so Grandma Young is my grandma's young friend. She's 77 years old, so young only to my grandma. Uh, and uh, when we run this um, service past her, she offered a lot of very good uh, observations. For example, we originally intended to pre-order the mask and by extension the vaccines using the ATM system where they can insert their uh, debit card into the ATM, wire about two euros to the Center for Disease Control and receive a um, copy uh, that they can then redeem for the mask rationing and so on or for the vaccination. Uh, but Grandma Young uh, very um, astutely observed that she is afraid of the ATM machine. That is to say, uh, she was afraid that once her uh, input gets wrong, maybe she will wire not two euro, but 2000 euros out. And she did not quite know how to recover from such a case. So there's a lot of anxiety. She said instead, uh, why don't you just use the national health insurance card? And without entering a password, she know already that by law, this can only be used for public service purposes and never for financial purposes. And because we have universal health coverage, we are actually much more inclusive than if we use the ATM uh, card, which would exclude people who did not have a debit card or if their bank account has been terminated. Uh, but everyone has a health card in Taiwan. So by her suggestion, we switch entirely to use the national health card for both PPE rationing and for vaccination now. And all the technological underpinnings, such as enabling the uh, Femiport or other convenience store machine to read the health card in a secure way, that falls uh, to to our duty. So that means that we are bringing technology to where people are. We're not asking people to conform to where technology are. And this is, I think, what is the most important thing about inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Tang, for that wonderful um, sharing. Um, so and, um, I've listened to, uh, as I was preparing for my questioning, I, I actually did quite a bit of research. Um, and, and with your conversation with many others, uh, you used the the term co-creation quite often, and you also mentioned it today as well. Uh, while I was searching uh, on the thing that was est established and accomplished in the past, uh, you being the digital minister, you have started the movement and hosted the website, the join.gov.tw, allowing citizens to truly involve in the government and affair. Would you please kindly explain to us how that works and the, how that can also apply to other governments such as in Canada here as well. Definitely. Join the GOV.TW is a one-stop shop uh, for participation online. So as you can see, the three main buttons. One is that uh, I have an idea. So it's the petition system. The second is the consultation system where the government has an idea and want to ask for feedback. And finally, there's the accountability layer where all the public budget is shown and everyone can actually see exactly how and when did those budget go out 
and people can interact with the public service even after their ideas is implemented uh, as a long-term public service. And so this idea of right, of being accountable is the most important thing in the joint platform. And you can see that in each and every ministry, more than 2,000 uh, different projects are being tracked there. And anytime people find a omission or anything that needs to improve better, they can start a petition in the same website. And the website even recommends similar petitions, much like how Amazon or Netflix recommend new books or movies uh, for new petitions for people to join. And once they collect 5,000 signatures, the minister is required to offer a point-by-point -point response and often every twice a month uh, if it's interagency cross-ministerial issues then I personally with my office hold collaboration meetings across different ministries for I'm a minister at large meaning that I work across different ministries so for each emerging issue if the different ministries have different takes then we meet face to face with the petitioner with the stakeholders and to date, more than one quarter of such petitions are started by people who are not even 18 years old. That is to say they could not vote, but they can already set agenda for the society. For example, um, banning plastic straws for take out of the national identity uh, drink, the bubble tea. Um, that is uh, something that started by the 17 years old. Uh, and when I uh, met her in the collaboration meeting, along with the ministries of economy and environmental protection, uh, I, I asked her, why are you starting such a petition that got so popular so quickly? And she's like, well, it's my civics class assignment. So you, you see that it's already part of the basic education. Thank you. So, so truly from out of it, um, young people are the future uh, the generation for the future. Uh, so they are the, the people who are contributing most of the ideas to the government for discussion. And it is, this is a fantastic idea that, that the government is allowing ordinary people like you and I or like me and Dr. Yang to be able to pitch in ideas uh, for a further support from other um, um, citizen and, and further taking that topic for a, a parliamental discussion. So truly the people are setting the agenda for the government. Uh, that That's sort of a idea behind that movement. Is that correct? That is correct. And for the public service, previously they were afraid of such participation because they think there's more noise than signal. But with the help of participation officers who are, you know, professionals uh, in engaging the hashtags, uh, as well as crowd moderation and by designing a space online where it's only possible to make contributions and not the more divisive conspiracy theory driven, more antisocial corner of the social media. We built in a sense our own pro-social media that's part of the civic infrastructure. So people would not uh, squander their calories uh, on the more antisocial corners of social media in order to have a town hall like deliberation. We can hold our deliberations using live stream technologies, using AI based listening and skill technologies that enable people to find a good enough consensus rather than dividing among the people's ideologies. I see. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, so by allowing people to pitch in ideas for discussion and the display publicly online, uh, this would truly uh, allow the government to become more transparent. Uh, so uh, to extension of that is my question would be your concept of radical transparency. Um, the government are often seen as a very close entity. Uh, citizens often have the perception that if you're not in it, then you will not know the truth. Some would even argue that even if you are in it, you still might not know the whole truth. One of your policy, as you mentioned, is to have radical transparency. Uh, myself, I'm quite interested in understanding why you added the extra descriptive term radical to transparency rather just the term transparency. Thank you. Um, radical transparency means transparency at the root. So, for example, uh, after I become digital minister, there's more than 1600 transcripts covering more than 6000 speakers and in 300 K or so speeches. And these are not the uh, meeting records uh, the, in that the usual public service produce. Rather, this is uh, a line by line transcript 
That is to say, when people visit me, when they lobby me, when I hold internal uh, cross-ministerial collaboration meetings and so on, you can see uh, and even conversation with uh, foreign MPs, uh, you, you can actually see the entire transcript and even link to uh, one. And this is unlike the uh, PDF-based publishing, you can actually link to one single utterance. So you can link to call me Audrey, uh, don't call me the right honorable uh, and so on, uh, but it's still within a context. So it's radical in two senses. One, everything is transcribed or published as video by default, but within 10 working days, if people have privacy concerns, if they relate an uh, anecdote of their friend that has not clear for publishing, they do get a chance to co-edit it before it goes out. But editing takes effort and not editing by default, everything goes out in the open. So that's what radical means in radical transparency. And the other uh, thing of, of radical transparency is that uh, it also extends to lobbyists and journalists. And indeed, the lobbyists and journalists find it quite radical. Uh, and uh, because of this arrangement, all the lobbyists lobby me, if you look at the record, based on the common good argument on the global goals, uh, covering the future generation's welfare, because they know this record will exist for future generations to see. In a sense, the future is watching and they will look quite bad if they make a suggestion that only benefit themselves or benefit the current generation at the expense of future generations. Okay. Wow, wow that, that's, that's really uh, fantastic. Um, my, my thought question on that particular um, topic on radical transparency, um, as a digital minister advocating for radical transparency, have you ever encountered any pushback from government official or policy maker? And how can the government truly accomplish radical transparency in your view? So only the people who choose to work with, with me adopt uh, this work out loud, radical transparency norm. So to date, um, about 12 different ministries have sent secondments to my office to work under radical transparency. I'm not giving them orders. I'm not taking orders either. We're just co-creating. So the people facing ministries, such as the Ministry of Culture, Education, Interior, National Communication uh, Commission, you know, the usual suspects, finance, uh, justice, uh, you name it, they are happy to join. Um, on the first year, the Foreign Service, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, did not join. Uh, but after they learned about the importance of Twitter diplomacy, uh, they also sent someone to learn about public diplomacy uh, using radical transparency. But for example, the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone. So I know nothing about national defense. So uh, I don't encounter pushbacks because I don't push. I only work with the parts of the public service that want to work under such um, terms. I don't actually go and knock on the Ministry of Defense uh, door and say, let's publish where our submarine or the uh, sea mines are. I am not doing that, so I don't encounter pushbacks. Well, well, thank, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. I just have one last question, and this is one of the questions that a lot of the parents have concerned about, and that's uh, regarding the excessive use of electronic device, which has been a major concern for many, including health profession for many years now. Uh, University of California, Berkeley published an article titled Gadget Addiction, which really caught my eye as I was uh, researching the articles on that particular topic. Uh, in a current age of instant gratifications, we are interested in your thought on the following questions. While technology has fostered the human race or humanity, does our current consumption pattern adversely impact our analytical and creative ability, leading to the loss of focus and communication and make us just an indexer of data rather than a bearer of knowledge? Are we addicted to our own creation, the electronic gadgets? Well, I'm not. And, and the trick of uh, me being free from the addiction, uh, there are two tricks. The first is don't touch the screen. Uh, and, and this is quite important. Uh, you will see that I interact with my iPad using this, uh, that's a Apple Pencil. And this is not a new habit. 
I've done that since the original Palm Pilot, so like 20 years ago, uh, and uh, later on the Sharp Zorus, uh, the Galaxy Note, uh, the Apple Pencil. So basically I interact with the screen uh, using a pencil, a stylus, or using a keyboard. The only time my uh, fingers touch the screen is just on zooming in and zooming out, and, and I don't stay on the screen long enough to form the addiction. Because if I touch the screen uh, too often, then I find that it's not me swiping the screen, the screen swiping me. It's like uh, they becoming a extension of my fingers or something. And I actually feel physical pain <laughs> if I don't get to touch the screen, if it runs out of battery and so on. Uh, but if I uh, go through an intermediary with intention, because with the stylus or keyboard or mouse, you have to begin with a intention and then this addiction do not form. And the other trick is that I sleep for eight hours every night. With sufficient sleep, uh, studies showed that it's less likely for people to form addiction, either to gadgets or to other addictive substances. And I get to sleep for eight hours because, well, I don't bring any um, connecting devices uh, to, to the place where I sleep. Uh, and so I do have an iPod touch. Uh, it serves as an alarm clock, sometimes plays some music, but it doesn't really enable anyone to find me. Uh, and so that is the trick of having sufficient sleep and therefore uh, being cured of whatever addiction that was beginning to develop on the previous night. Thank you. You had just convinced me to go ahead and buy in a Samsung notebook uh, or notepad. Uh, I've been thinking about buying that for a long time. My family's been pushing me to get it. I currently had the Samsung that I, I still use my finger to 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 interact with, but I, I'm I'm convinced now to buy a different one with the stylus. Good for you. Yeah. So well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Tang. I think my time is up. I'll turn the um the spotlight back to Dr. Yang. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Lai, and then so much um, um, wonderful, so many you know wonderful conversation that we can go on for hours. And then um, I have unmuted. Uh, the, I mean, I'm, I'm able everyone to um, open uh, the, to turn on their mic. And if you have any questions um, for the minister, please raise your hand. You can see that raise hand button on the top of your screen, and please raise your hand, and I'll and then we'll um, invite you to um, ask question. And um, yeah, and then while we are waiting, I'll take the chance to ask the first question, maybe. I mean, um, you know, I'm quite jealous and I have to say that being an art historian, I'm falling behind. I, I seem to live in the you know 19th century and you are having the Apple pencil and I'm still with my pad and pencil. <laughs> And so definitely that's not addiction. My, my question is that uh, we are, as an art historian, we are concerned about the preservation of history. But while the technology moves so fast, it's somehow that, you know, it feels like um, the personal memory probably would die even when one person passed away or losing the password or, you know, losing the Facebook um, the page or even, you know, the memory is no longer in this kind of substantial or, you know, visible way you know touchable physical existence and then what's your view on this you know between the you know the the, the preserving the so-called you know the personal and the collective memory and the new technology and what's your solution for that thank you yeah i think this is a very important uh question and it relates to both right it relates to the uh, history of places and the history of individuals and both are equally important for the history of places, <clears throat> we have worked with the ministries of culture and science and technology to digitalize the important uh, places in Taiwan's history. <clears throat> so as you can see, the Kikumoto uh, Hyakaten, uh, <clears throat> the Juyuan Baihuo, or <clears throat> the Kao Cruise Terminal, that's a newer one, um, the Taichung Railroad Station, and many the old buildings and so on. Instead of uh, asking people to physically travel to that place, um, which is quite difficult among the international pandemic, uh, we're bringing these buildings to you. Um, they are 3D scanned using photogrammetry uh, and put into virtual reality. So just like the free assets on 
uh, Flickr or on Pixabay and so on. Uh, these are the 3D free assets that people can then use in their movies, in their video games, in their interaction uh, with the arts and things like that. And that adds a lot of textures uh, to the co-presence because like currently you're in your room with a lot of books. I mean, I'm in my room with zero books. <laughs> and we, while we were talking, <laughs> we're not quite uh, in the same place. But this uh, sort of what we call Taiwan Digital Assets Library enable us with just a little bit of uh, rehearsal and tweaking, uh, switch to the Teams together mode. Uh, I believe Zoom uh, and other like Skype has similar mode now, and we can place ourselves in exploratory uh, place uh, and enjoying some sort of co-presence feelings together. And our personal like um, family memories and so on, there's also a Taiwan cultural memory bank that offers free hosting I've uploaded quite a few photos by my grandma, by my dad, and so on, into this place. Uh, and it also has a, a facility where everybody can curate and ask for more contributions about one historical incident, about one historical event from their fellow citizens. So they will be motivated to interview each other and upload the old photos, the videos, and so on, that adds not just to the individual, but also to the social sectors shared memory online. So I believe um, the technology can, of course, hamper, but can also assist people in telling the stories as a social sector. Thank you. That's quite reassuring, and I hope that you know the there'll be more funding also available for you know <laughs> when the the software needs updating as well. I think that's uh, one of the concerns for the museum curators. <laughs> for the for the two websites, we actually uh, did a historical reinterpretation of the word infrastructure in 2016. Minister Zheng Li Jun of Culture at a time, uh, we worked together to convince the National Budget Office that Ji Chu infrastructure uh, covers also intangible infrastructure such as these two websites. Uh, so not just things made of concrete, like literally concrete things uh, qualify for the special act budget. Nowadays, the digital equivalent of them also qualify for the budget. And I think Taiwan is so advanced um, in this in this sense. Yeah, and then we have uh, the first question. Uh, we will invite uh, In Hong Chen. In Hong Chen and um, well, um, uh, well, can you unmute your microphone um, for questions? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. This is this is Patrick. Actually, I'm together with Ian Hung Chen. Uh, thank you, Minister. It was really very interesting. I have uh, so many questions, but I'm going to go with one first, uh, which is, you know, the holographic. I'm so much looking forward to have a holographic presence. I love the 3D effect. You know, the three possibility to go inside a gallery and and visit. But uh, when do you think this uh, is anything in works for holographic uh, opportunities? because I think that would be the next step for, for technology. Definitely. Uh, and I, I also uh, do that every day. I actually have the headset with me. Uh, and so I, I've 3D modeled myself. Uh, and uh, you can interact with me in any of those uh, 3D spaces. Uh, for example, one uh, space that I frequent uh, is the XR space. And as you can see uh, in the XR space, Everyone uh, can wear such a um, like no wire required headset and interact with one another uh, in, in real time and have uh, activities. And so it allows for not just easy modeling of one's own avatar, but also because this is actually a scanner a depth a camera, you can also scan your room uh, or your uh, place, your venue, and then bring other people in into that venue uh, for co-creation and social interaction. Um, there's many uh, places already using this for tours, for interaction, for education and things like that. I think, um, the main problem uh, that we used to face in Taiwan was that uh, we did not have a uh, tele-education uh, mandate at any point in time until about two weeks ago. So <laughs> this is oh, the wow. first <laughs> that we that we have to use tele-education. We, we still do not have a lockdown, but we've uh, out of caution, switched to tele-education in the past couple of weeks. So the education facilities are just now learning 
uh, the presence of such technologies. So give them a little bit of time. And I think by their summer vacation, some of them will be able to work in virtual augmented reality and holographic reality. But previously, it's very hard to convince the teachers to use this because simply there was no need to. Mm, I understand. Thank you so much. Now, just it takes me to the next question, if I may. Just have one more. Uh, I have more, but just one more. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, related to health, like you said, when we touch the screen and so on. And I'm resisting the VR as much as I love it to, you know, the experience of it. But I'm, I'm really resisting in terms of, uh, you know, how it can affect my eyes, my brain. But is any research around new technology like uh, to know how much it affects human being, you know, before we find some beautiful uh, outlet to help us? Uh, do we do testing on humans to see how how it can be, neg be negative for sleep, for anything, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's a lot of VR safety studies. Uh, and my suggestion is that only interact in VR as a shared reality. That is to say, uh, use it to connect to real human beings uh, in the presence of spaces that are real places. You will note that when I show the Taiwan Digital Assets Library, I emphasize that these buildings and venues are actually there, that you can one day visit it. The farthest I've traveled on VR uh, is on the International Space Station. Of course, I can't quite easily physically go there or to the Matterhorn Mountain in Switzerland. Uh, but still, these are real places that has real people's real memory attached to it. And I think this is crucially important for if we only live in our own solo realities, then I do uh, fear that we'll get addicted to such experiences that are not social and, and frankly speaking, anti-social. Okay. So I would uh, suggest definitely uh, read up on the VR safety studies, but also use VR as a shared reality, not a solo reality. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you so much in function. And then our next question um, is from Anne Kang. Uh, Anne, and could you uh, unmute your microphone? Yes. Um, hi, Minister Tang. Uh, my name is Anne Kang. I'm the min, uh, member of Legislative Assembly in British Columbia in Canada. And uh, previously we have met before in Vancouver in uh, UBC when you were presenting with Lucy. I know you have a photographic memory, so you probably remember me. Yep. Um, so right now my position is um, now the Minister of Advanced Education, so now oversight of, of UBC. Uh, my, my question is, is really to technology because I, I used to be the Minister of Technology as well just a few months ago. Um, so BC has not been as fortunate um, as, as Canada. Um, we, we had a lot of COVID transmissions and so therefore uh, you know, our post-secondary system was um, uh, pivoted to online. And, and so there was a lot of mental health issues, but as well, um, faculty, staff, and students had to learn how to pivot themselves online. Um, I was wondering um, if you could share some of the experience um, if, if that happened in, in Taiwan, because I know there was no transmission, so perhaps there was no reason to. Um, if not, can you share... Um, what is transformative right now in Taiwan in terms of digital technology, uh, areas of research and development engineering, and, and as well, um, what steps is Taiwan taking to encourage women uh, to um, go into the technology computer science uh, sector where you know, we see it's more of a men dominated sector? Yeah, I, I have this recruitment uh, short clip uh, where I uh, recruited people um, into the uh, girls in cybersecurity, uh, usually like um, high school or uh, young undergrad level to work in cybersecurity and study cybersecurity. Uh, and there's this interaction uh, in that clip uh, where this girl asked, uh, and I quote, isn't cybersecurity mostly for boys? And I responded, right? Computer never ask about my agenda, <laughs> which is literally true, right? When you study cybersecurity, the computer do not ask uh, which agenda you're, you're in. In Taiwan, uh, we do have a pretty good um, um, gender equality in, for example, our ministers' um, parliamentary um, 
that is to say 40% or more, actually more than 40% uh, people in the parliament uh, are, are women. Uh, in the ministerial um, cabinet, we're currently lower than we probably should, uh, but we are also working on improving it thanks to the Gender Equality Committee. Uh, one place where uh, we are seeing a lot of growth but still falls short is exactly as you point out, is in the graduates in science, technology, engineering and math. At the moment, I think we just reached the one quarter uh, percentage of women uh, who graduate in STEM. And so we work with uh, not just educators, but with the students themselves to find out what's blocking them to work on the STEM <clears throat> issues. And uh, not just, of course, the pink mask sometimes help <laughs> for gender mainstreaming, but we also find that uh, people are looking to uh, their careers uh, with a mind on shortening the gap between the genders on the so-called equal pay issue. And that is actually the main concern. So we're now doing a lot of uh, efforts to uh, narrow the gender pay gap uh, at the moment, still at 14%. Uh, but as you can see, it's going very quickly downward so that uh, we can anticipate in 10 years time, um, we will see a kind of negligible uh, gender pay gap that will then encourage more people to work in STEM and to graduate in STEM, uh, regardless of their gender. And the kind of rallying cry is that biology should not uh, determine destiny. Of course, having uh, our president being 100% women also helps here. Yeah. And thank you so much. And thank you, Anne, for the great question. And our next question uh, goes to um, is from um, Hawinda Sandu. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Um, yeah, could you unmute your microphone? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. You pronounced it really well. Uh, hi, Minister Tang. I am Harwinder Sandhu. I am the member of Legislative Assembly uh, with my sister Ann Kang, and I'm so thrilled to finally get the opportunity to meet you. I've heard so many great things about you from Ann, and also I've been following Taiwan, how they've been leading the COVID guidelines and Today, when Dr. Lai, I, I thank him for inviting me. I was so looking forward to this uh, uh, in order to get to meet you. Uh, before becoming an MLA, Minister Tang, I was working in healthcare for the last 17 years in BC. And uh, my last uh, role was in a nurse, uh, like a care coordinator role on a COVID unit. Uh, so being in the leadership role when first COVID rolled in and then lack of PPE and all the, like we didn't know enough about COVID and what effect it will have. It was highly stressful for all my staff and for my colleagues. Uh, so over the time now that numbers have spiked even more, it came and go in the waves. Uh, and healthcare workers, as you know, around the world, doctors and nurses already work shift work nights and days, and that already take toll on their mental health. So here in BC, as we know, the COVID had effect on mental health all around the world. Here in BC, what we're hearing from uh, healthcare front lines that they're at the breaking point. And I wonder what uh, initiatives, what can you share that how Taiwan, what, how Taiwan is handling that mental stress, whether it's uh, in healthcare or the seniors or, you know, uh, public health and how did the technology play that crucial role? As I said, I've been diligently following and I was quite impressed. So I would really like to know your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, our technological measures observe the ideas of calm technology, meaning that the more people interact with the technology, the more assured people feel. And that is only possible because we co-design such technologies with the people who are the most vulnerable. Uh, for example, the very senior people, as you mentioned, the people in the medical front lines and so on. So we design, for example, the SMS check-in system, not because it's cutting edge technology. SMS is not cutting edge technology, but because everybody know how to send a SMS. We develop uh, the technology based on the healthcare cost, not because it's most advanced. It's not. It's introduced in 2004, right after SARS, but because everyone has at least 16 years of um, 
a, sh a short interaction with how the health card works for uh, everyone above 16 years old, of course. But what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, use the part of the touch points that people already are familiar with before the pandemic that enable people to anchor their familiarity with such technologies in a way that assure them that this will continue to work counter pandemic. In some jurisdictions, they enforce the quarantine using new technology such as wearable Bluetooth dongles, bracelets, or other technologies. But because these are new, uh, we didn't have those before the pandemic. It creates extra anxiety when this begins to more function. But what we've done instead in our digital quarantine is that we send a SMS message deliberately shaped very much in their text, like the earthquake warnings. And people have had a lot of experience with location-based earthquake warnings and advanced flood warnings mm -hmm. way before the pandemic. So people understand, for example, the location-based quarantine SMS will not be able to read uh, their emails or their WhatsApp messages because people understand it's on a different layer of things and therefore feel much more familiar and therefore they feel assured when they receive the quarantine-based SMS messages. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's very reassuring too, because otherwise you will feel that you know, under big data, and it seems like we live in a world with all the civilian cameras and the trace and track, you know, the, all the apps, and then as if we live in the big brother world as well. Yeah, thank That's you. That's right. So put data only where you already trust. That's our design principle. Yeah, and, and our next question um, comes from uh, Xinchi from Bergman. Yeah, and Xinchi, could you unmute your uh, microphone, please? Hi, uh, Mr. Tan. Um, nice meeting you. I'm a UBC professor, so living in Vancouver. And you, my, I have two questions for you. So first of all, is that I joined Ye Bing Chen Jiao So's um, uh, it has a Facebook group, and currently there are 80, roughly 80,000 teachers on this particular group, and you know about it. So I'm trying to think, and this might be a very easy task for you, to see if there's a way to streamline some of these contributions from teachers, from parents, so that it can be much easier for teachers who are trying to cope with these online teaching and learning. The reason I'm talking about this is because in the past 16 months, I have been trying to teach my colleagues how to teach online. And in many ways, I know the struggle people have encountered in the first months and probably continue to struggle right now. And so it would be easy for if it's possible to try to figure it out in a way that we can actually streamline some of these really wonderful contributions. Secondly, um, Taiwan in the past three weeks, from my observations, has shared a lot of data, which is wonderful because these kind of data in terms of outbreaks help the public and help the government to communicate with the public. So in many ways, I wonder if this is something um, I have been trying to push the collaboration between Canada and Taiwan in terms of trying to have a transparency in terms of the data communications, because only transparency can enhance the trust. So um, just those two questions, probably Thank really you. big, but. Uh -huh. <clears throat> really great questions. Um, probably uh, more suited for five hour seminars, but I have five minutes, <laughs> so I will be brief. Um, so yeah, uh, the great um, social sector communities in Taiwan, that includes Ye Bing Chen, uh, Professor Scrip, uh, as well as uh, I think Dream to the Power of N, uh, Meng De and Sifang, and many other groups, they are instrumental in creating uh, the guidelines for tele-education as well as for competence-based education. I think the streaming lining uh, you're referring to aligns very well with the basic education curriculum. 
Previously, we had difficulties partly because uh, in the third year of the middle school, uh, that's to say uh, the ninth grade as well as the 12th grade, uh, they were still using the old curriculum that more uh, emphasized on the literacy, that is to say the teacher holding the right answers <laughs> rather than competence, uh, whereas the student creates the answers with the teachers. Um, and so having the teachers uh, work across two curriculum paradigm uh, is really difficult because online education only shines if you give the students the individual freedom to work with the material on their own, on their capstone projects and so on. It's almost impossible to synchronize across the screen uh, the, the progress of all your students. Um, so, but fortunately, uh, beginning next semester, uh, all the high school education will be using the new curriculum. Uh, and so that imparts a lot of more room for individual schools to incorporate the kind of co-creation spaces uh, that is now being developed by the Dream of Power of N or by uh, Professor Ye Bing Cheng and so on. So uh, I will uh, help the Ministry of Education to look into incorporating them into the guidelines the not just pandemic uh, prevention, but also teleeducation in general guidelines, especially on the middle school level. So thank you for bringing this, this up. Um, your, your second question, um, I, I think data is, um, is a very abstract term. So we talk about you know, data governance, uh, data norms, but really in every field, there is a very different norm. So just like uh, when you look at publications, text, the journalists have their uh, norm about text in the journalism sector, uh, fact checking, balancing the sources and so on. The academic publishers have their own norms, uh, preprint, open access, of course, being the newer norms, but about citation, about the rigor and things like that. But nobody would say, let's train all the journalists and all the academic professors into the text norms. That, that just doesn't even make sense because journalism and uh, academic publishing follows different norms. So rather than uh, saying that we need to develop data collisions or data trusts or data relationships, nowadays uh, I usually say let's work on, for example, uh, building interoperable health record systems. Let's make sure that my vaccination records uh, is recognized by the Canadian vaccination uh, inspectors. Uh, let's make sure that these health norms are carried out through the digital realm that connects people to people rather than just machines to machines. But still observe exactly the same health sector norms. Uh, and uh, I think for the state to state relationships, um, the can Canada and Taiwan both have the state assured healthcare, state assured education, state assured communication and transportation, as well as indigenous rights. On these particular regards, it's the state duty to observe the social norms and build infrastructure on the digital realm that realize those norms. So my suggestion will be start uh, bilateral conversations based on these specific sectors, and that would enable the data norms to converge much more easily than if we begin talking about data norms on international trade, e-commerce, and so on, which are less of the state's duty, and frankly speaking, the state may not have the most capacity to set such norms. Thank you, and thank you so much, and to uh, Fong, uh, Professor Fong and Bergman for the good questions. And then speaking of the open access, you know, that would really create a lot of issues as well. We love the open access, but then thinking about the image copyright. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so I think um, the time is up and then, it, then we would like to um, thank our speaker, the keynote speaker, uh, Minister Audrey Tang again, and also, you know, Dr. Wen Nai, it's wonderful discussion um, between you both. And it is really, you know, wonderful to um, to you know, listen to um, both of your, you know, the, the very insightful views and then quite thought provoking as well, leaving us a lot to think about and wonderful.
Thank you so much. And then, so we would like to thank the audience again who contribute to this and uh, the live Q&A. That is lovely to have you. And we hope to see you again in our next lecture. That will be in July. And then artist uh, Yu Zhengda um, will be talking about the performance in the expand field of liquefied queerness, and which will be, you know, quite um, uh, visually stunning and a bit um <laughs> anyway but um so we are looking forward to seeing you again and also in october we have artists Li Mingwei and uh, talking about the six stories um, of, of, about the beauty so we'll um we'll hope to uh, welcome you back and um, but uh thanks again to uh minister and thank you so much for your time we know this is maybe the most busy time um, for you in the pandemic and while in an outbreak just you know I reached Taiwan and then you are so amazing, you know, creating the, the very um, sufficiently with all the new apps. And then in the UK, we are very jealous about this as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. And so uh, wish um, everyone um, take care and stay mm -hmm. safe and stay healthy. And uh, we'll see you again. Uh, thank, in you. The future. thank you so much. Live long uh, and prosper. Bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tang. Bye. Thank you.